But before I request Dr. Banerjee to kindly take up the first session on self-management, the driver for corporate excellence, I'll be introducing him briefly. But before that, may I request the Vice President of Calcutta Management Association, Mr. T. V. S. Shinoy, to kindly say a few words and welcome the gathering. Mr. Shinoy, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anirban, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a quick check if I can, if I'm audible. Dr. Yes, Banerjee. sir. Now you are audible, Vince. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think you needed a little <laughs> nice warm-up connection, Anirban. And, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Dr. Banerjee uh, from EILN, thank you very much for organizing the session. Uh, I'm TV Shinoy, the Vice President of the Calcutta Management Association. And I'm also uh, with Tata Steel for the past 28 years. And this continues to be my first job, which I joined from the campus. And when I heard the topic uh, Anirban was saying, and he mentioned two elements to it. One was uh, self-management and the driver for corporate excellence. And second one, which is even more closer to my heart, role of values, ethics, and spirituality in management. And when you look back at the last one year and look at the pandemic, what has, when it started off and where we ended, None of us could have ever imagined our lives would have been touched so much and so vastly differently from what we started off March of 2019, uh, 2020. And here, uh, especially when I'm seeing such a huge number of students also connected and all of them will be joining the corporate world, I thought what better than this time for uh, preparing oneself and hearing the luminaries speak uh, when, when one gets into the world of corporate excellence. Incidentally, we had last evening the annual awards function of the Calcutta Management Association of, uh, of Excellence. And there are plenty of stories there, which I would urge all of you to have a look at the recordings uh, on YouTube of the awards event. Wonderful stories of leadership, wonderful stories of excellence. I'm reminded uh, of uh, our founder, Jamshirji Tata, I uh, mean, talk of values and ethics, there's no better than the Tatas to be a beacon. And he said, maybe a century ago, in a free enterprise, the community is not just another stakeholder, but in fact, the very purpose of its existence. When you have something like this as a North Star or a values, it percolates down to each of the employees and perhaps to each of the stakeholders as well. But what does it mean for us? Uh, for what does it mean for us as individuals who are perhaps in the, in the, in the college and uh, undergrad students and now stepping into the corporate world, I would say there are two key things. Values and ethics don't erode with time. They're your North Star and they'll continue to be a North Star till you go to your grave. And it is what that you have with you as a values will carry you through in a corporate world. And let me tell you a beautiful story of a young officer who had joined me and my team maybe around 10 years ago. And what is the kind of value she, she stood for? And all of you who are going to join the corporate world, it's not something rocket science, but small little anecdotes like this, which will help you to grow in, the corporate, uh, in your career head. It's like this. When Aditi was, she's a young 23 year old officer from the campus from one of the MBA colleges, and she had been assigned a sales task. She had been told, okay, I need this sales report by the end of tomorrow at 8 p.m. And believe me, Aditi would have ensured she would have sent the report to me at 7.30 p.m. You're adding a little of credit balance in Aditi's bank balance. After a few days, you ask Aditi, well, I need this report as well as the sales target plan for the month and I need it by the after tomorrow. Aditi does it by tomorrow and she also ensures the sales target are met by the after tomorrow. You add a little more of bank balance, the credit bank balance in, a, in Aditi's bank account. Small, small incidences, small, small commitments to promises will only enhance one's values. So are you the Aditi in your heart or when you step into the corporate world? Small promises and small steps make up to a big castle and they say, 
You can build castles in the air, but always build foundations under them. So when, what is it relevant to today's world? When we step into the corporate world, and when you look at various people and uh, the various challenges one faced in the, with colleagues, with bosses, with customers, are you clear what you stand out for? Are you clear what your North Star is? And hence my suggestion to each one of you, what is the value that you stand for? If you're able to get your North Star right at the beginning of the career, have some great counsel, I think it'd be a wonderful step for you in the corporate world. Hence, very clearly, the role of values is something which is fundamental to growing and growing successfully in the corporate world. And I've seen it time and time again, brilliant youngsters who can go by the wayside, brilliant youngsters who go to the top because they stand for a certain value and live by it. Well, when you're doing such a world, when you're all stepping into such a world, there are three things which I would suggest you all need to look out for. First, find a mentor at work. And as you see today, you have Mr. Ra from LNT, you have Mr. Judadit Jas from ICICF Poor Life, you have Pallavi from HRBP. Of course, you've got uh, Mr. Banerjee from EILM, and I think is a great institute for us for all learnings. And of course, Mr. Dutt uh, from UN. So what does it mean for all of us? From each one of the mentors whom you're going to listen, and in your corporate world or in a student world, find a mentor who can help you take shortcuts. Believe me, a mentor has seen it and has seen it all. You can bounce off your values, your ethical dilemmas, your value dilemmas to with each of them. Find it and find it to somebody whom you can do it. Believe me, it is significant, significant, important uh, advice which will help you tremendously in your life in terms of having shortcuts to success. Find a mentor and go to him and assume him for your problem. That's one. Second is chase a passion beyond work. Each of us are bogged down in our work so much that we miss the good things in life. Uh, it's great to be hardworking, but even greater to have a passion beyond work. Corporate life or entrepreneur life is ruthless is not going to be forgiving. And you need pressure walls and to let go your uh, release. And you have a great uh, kind of passion with beyond work. I think you will get you there. And what does it connect uh, to the session today? Spirituality. I think it is one of the most fabulous topics which I sense could be one of the pressure, bu pressure busters in terms of your corporate world. So we have seen values, how it's important. We've seen ethics, it's your North Star. We've seen spirituality, it could be one of your passions beyond work. And all of this mixed together, when done well, can have a great corporate life. And I, and I, before I conclude my thought, I just leave with one thought with all of you, that is always great to dream. Always be clear of what your North Star is. Always stand by your values. Don't cow down by your bosses. Unless you have a clear vision and what you stand for, you'll never be able to sit on the fence. And I don't want you all to sit on the fence. You should have an opinion and you should have a value as you get ahead in the corporate world. Thank you very much uh, from CMA. Thank you, EILM, EIILM, uh, Dr. Banerjee. I think it is wonderful partnering with you. And for all the people who have joined in here, I hope you're going to have a great two hours, which will help you to shape your careers and profit the mind. Thank you and over to you, Dr. Banerjee, uh, for the next session. Uh, before I request Dr. Banerjee to take over, I'll just take this opportunity of introducing Dr. Banerjee to all of you. Though he needs no introduction, I'll be just taking a few words to introduce him. Professor Dr. R. P. Banerjee, with a rich, ex rich experience of over three and a half decades, Professor Rama Prasad Banerjee perfectly harmonizes academic brilliance with industry expertise. Basically a professor of finance and ethics, he has taught almost all areas of management, both in context of transnational corporations and domestic organizations. As an international educationist, Professor R.P. Banerjee has been focusing on the Indian spiritual values and 
spreading the fundamental message of Vedic civilization. He has focused on certain noble values like integrity, serenity, honesty, truthfulness, cooperation, sacrifice, etc., for manpower management and managing enterprises in the business, social, and global context. He has delivered lectures on invitations at numerous universities abroad, including Pennsylvania State University, Texas University, Austin, Texas Women's University, Texas University, Dallas, Carlton State University, University of Tennessee, University of Kansas, Arlington State University, University of Hamburg, Stockholm University, Northwestern University, Mingdao University of Taiwan, and Patum, Patum Thani University of Thailand, amongst others. He has worked as senior executive for over a de decade in the industry and taught various areas in management in leading Indian and international organizations, including Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. He was a member of the Committee of Induction Program, Ministry of HRD, Government of India. He was also the Vice President at Large International Association of Accounting, Education and Research, USA. He holds a PhD in management from Calcutta University and has do done his postdoctoral research at Stockholm University. His publications include more than 200 articles in prestigious national and international journals. He has authored nine books and co-authored close to a dozen books, the latest of them being a sage publication entitled Art and Science of Management in the Digital Era. Few of his acclaimed awards uh, the acclaimed awards of Professor Banerjee are as follows. Education Leadership from BBC World News, February 2017. CSR Excellent Chairman of Leading Institute of India, conferred by the Competition Success Review in May 20, 2020. National Education Awards 2018 by ABP News in July. Thought Leader Award presented by CIMA in July 2015. Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishna Award uh, in 2012. These are only a few of the awards that he has received. So we would not take any more, more time of yours. And I would request Dr. R.P. Banerjee to kindly take over and take us to the first session on self-management, the driver for corporate excellence. Sir, it's up to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Honeyman. And uh, thank you, Mr. Sinai. Good evening to everybody. and. Uh, well, I, at the outset, I would like to profusely thank Calcutta Management Association to have agreed to this, uh, you know, uh, point of uh, having a session on the self-management, concept of self-management and spirituality at workplace. And thanks uh, to the entire board of Calcutta Management Association uh, and Mr. Chennai in particular. Uh, today, I'm going to talk, I believe, um, uh, mine is until uh, 6.30, so, so I have 40-45 minutes time. Of course, uh, you know, if I get permission from the audience and from you all, then I can take another 5 to 10 minutes if, if you permit. And I'll try to uh, complete within this time frame. Uh, so self-management uh, is something which uh, uh, we have been talking and uh, there are a lot of people in the world, I believe in the various places, people have been talking about. It's a traditional concept and it's got somehow uh, connected with uh, the concept of values and ethics. I just begin with the concept of ethics uh, in the modern era. How are we, you know, connected to the principles and practices of ethics? I'm just uh, going to mention in a nutshell. Uh, is correct uh, when Mr. Chennai had mentioned about, uh, you know, the founder of Tata's. You know, I have a great respect for him, and he's a person uh, who has imbibed uh, certain kinds of values in the corporate, which uh, has got two aspects. One is, you know, in the corporate functioning, and the other one is connected with the people working in the organization. However, there was a formal, uh, you know, for announcement of, you know, st structuring a department of ethics. Uh, first of all, uh, Texas Instrument, I'll talk about, in the early 70s and mid 70s, they had a separate department called Department of Ethics. And probably that was the first in its kind. 
And, uh, you know, for the Department of Ethics uh, with Carl Skuzland as the director of that, you know, uh, it had functioned so well that, you know, it had functioned as an independent department. And uh, that was a, you know, very important point. Uh, but then uh, ethics uh, kind of, uh, you know, for, as a policy, ethics as a principle and practice for the corporates is now spread so much that uh, it's, it's very difficult to find out, uh, start, you know, listed company in the stock markets having, uh, you know, without having this ethics policy or ethics pra practice. When they come up with this, you know, for, uh, corporate uh, uh, policies, uh, policy statements, then obviously ethics and values plays an important role in that. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, this uh, uh, as a point of, uh, you know, of, uh, beginning like ethics has been drawn from a more, you know, word called ethikos, E-T-H-I-K-O-S. Ethikos has got a meaning, it's a Greek word, uh, Greek, uh, you know, root of the word of ethics. It's got a meaning called character. Now, what do we understand about character? What is the character? What does it stand for? A uh, character definitely pertains to an individual, a uh, character of an individual. However, we can identify the, you know, organizational character also. I wrote a paper long back, uh, almost 30 years ago, that is, you know, organizational character as a challenge to organizational behavior. Now, we do talk about organizational behavior, but, you know, organizational character is more fundamental to organizational behavior. I'm not getting into that topic, but, you know, as, a, as an individual, when it comes to behavior, you know, comparing between behavior and character, character uh, proves to be more fundamental than behavior in an individual context, and that can be drawn to a, you know, a collective context as well. So when we talk about the character of an individual, what are the things? You know, the moment we talk about character, we do mean willingly that it's a good character. Now, that was, you know, character is getting qualified by a term called goodness. <clears throat> now, what is this goodness of a character? So, Anivan has mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, certain points, uh, which uh, I believe uh, these are the fundamental things for, a, for an individual. Integrity, for example. Integrity, how do we take integrity in a corporate context? If I give a word, if I make a, you know, make an announcement, or if I make a promise, in the context of a company, then how do I justify that? Uh, do I have to go beyond the you know uh, boundaries of my personal? <laughs> Sorry, it got muted. That's why I have made it unmute again. Yeah, when, I, uh, when I'm at the boundary of my personal limits, then uh, probably I have to find out what are the things uh, where I am actually stuck up with. The promise that I make to the world and the promise that I make to myself, whether these two are different or not. I'm at a point that, you know, the, uh, what the mind says, the mouth should speak the same thing. The, you know, the words that you utter and the things that you think about, there should be a concurrence between. If there is a gap between, then the person becomes a hypocrite. There shouldn't be any gap between. The mind and mouth, meaning the synchronization between the mind and mouth. So, you know, how does it come? It's the fundamental of a person. It comes from within. It comes from your inner understanding, understanding of the inner world. So, you know, if, uh, there is something, uh, let us assume that there is something called inner world. And of course, we have an our ex external world. If I am interiorized, meaning if I am oriented to the inner world, then I find out, you know, the realities therein. On the other hand, when I am oriented to the external world, I get the things through my sense organs and multiplied formations of the sense organs which the technology and other instruments, gadgets can help me for. So I can see the world and the world can see me. If I can assume 
at, as the Immanuel Kant uh, wanted to assume, and he made an assumption that there are two types of, uh, you know, elemental existence in a personality. One is your empirical existence. The other one is your, uh, you know, eternal existence. If I may call, and uh, he uh, had branded the empirical existence as a phenomenon, and there is an eternal component of it, which is a noumen. Actually, the Immanuel Kant had drawn this from, uh, you know, one of our bases in uh, the Rig Vedas, and later on, uh, that was again transcribed by Lord Krishna and was told to Arjuna also. It is actually the inner world and the outer world, the intrinsics and the extrinsics. Intrinsics is the Akshar Purush, and the extrinsics is the Shkara Purush. Akshar is the eternal. And kara is a, you know, empirical. Empirical, when we interact with the world, when we are one with the world, we take part in the activities of the world. I'm a worker, I'm a manager, I'm a leader, I'm a, you know, beggar, I'm a king. Whatever be my identity, then, I, you know, that is an external identity of mine. And that's how the people that look at me. And that's how the people at uh, People always look at you, and this is how you were known to the world. But there is another dimension, which is noumenon, the you know, intrinsic personality of uh, the individual. And at the intrinsic personality, what is your identity? Who can tell that? And how do we reveal that? Now it's said, you know, psychologists or applied psychologists, not in, uh, particularly, would tell that, oh, yes, your behavior comes out with that, and your behavior would tell that. Yes, of course, that's true. Behavior would come out with that, but then behavior doesn't reveal everything. I can make, you know, make a behavior which is not you know, connected with my intrinsic character. Now, characters create a difference. Characters are the you know, differentiating factors of the individual. The behaviors are not the differentiating factors. Characters are the differentiating factors. I'm, you know, arguing this and I have a difference of opinion with the OB group and you know the behavioral school wherein they say that the behavior is the differentiating factor. Behavior is not the character is the differentiating factor and behavior is a you know subordinate to the character. I'll explain like for example if you take a piece of iron it's got a properties. It can melt uh, at a particular uh, temperature it can provide you the strength of you know strength resilience you know it can provide you that, you know, we understand uh, what, is the, what is a piece of metal called iron. We understand through the attributes of iron. Similarly, you know, we understand uh, the attributes of gold, uh, silver, you know, uh, platinum, you know, copper. We, we understand. How do we understand? Through the attributes. And the attributes are fundamental to those metals. I'm talking about the attributes of individuals. And you know, attributes make a difference. Attributes are the differentiating factor. And how does it contribute to the corporate world? I'll tell you. Like, you know, let me take an you know, example of two persons, person A and person B. And uh, person A and person B, I'm assuming, they both have the same kind of skill set, competence, and uh, you know, capabilities, and uh, you know, for the desired uh, qualification or whatever you are. Uh, you know, your prescriptions, both of them fit in properly. And, uh, you know, but then uh, let's come to the inner world of the two persons, if I may calculate that in quantitative terms or in a subjective way. So let's assume that, you know, uh, the person A is very aggressive, rugged, and the person A thinks that, oh, yes, I'll win the thing, I'll win the game anyhow, and I'll reach to the, you know, target uh, by uh, through winning the game. And my objective is to win the target. I want to achieve the target. You know why? Because you know, when I'm in a corporate, I have to achieve the target. Target achievement is one of the fundamental things for a corporate organization. And an individual and an executive has to conform to that. So the target is there. And uh, uh, person A thinks that, yes, I have to achieve the target. And how do I achieve you know, the target? That's none of your business. You're my boss. You know, I achieve the target with the legal boundaries of yourself. I conform to the legality and I, I, I'm there to achieve the target. And I'm surely, surely I'm going to achieve the target. Uh, so I'm target oriented. 
I, I, I know how to reach the ends. I'm very much careful about my ends always in mind. And I can develop my strategies, redefine my strategies. I can redesign my strategies. And I know how to reach out and I should reach out and maybe that I have reached out at a certain point of time. There is another person, person B, with the same level of competence and uh, you know, for, uh, this, uh, all the skill sets present in person B are docile, uh, uh, you know, for person, a person who is uh, submissive, but then person knows that, you know, this is my target, but person thinks, yes, this is a straight way to reach the target, which is easier for me to, you know, reach the target by ending the process. If I, I tell some lies, if I give some wrong inputs to some other people and then reach my target, you know, for, I can do that. But you see, you see, I am a person with uh, so much of, you know, inheritance. Uh, my father was that, my grandfather was that. So I have something which I need to prove myself to be in line with. So therefore, I cannot pollute my lineage. I cannot pollute my, you know, the, the cultural heritage of my family, my society, my nation. You know, therefore, I just follow a different path that's hazardous. Uh, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, a path which is uh, carved out, which is, uh, you know, skewed, maybe difficult to reach. I have to, uh, you know, spend a lot of things. I, I have to burn a lot of oils, you know, and then I can reach, but I have got the determination to reach. So B is taking a, you know, a tougher way, tougher path. And uh, why B is not conforming to the shortcut is not taking a shortcut. Uh, B is thinking that, oh yes, I have to reach the ends, but at the same time, I have to maintain the sanctity, the you know fairness of the means. Now, here is the point, you know, a person between A and B, all of the things remaining constant when there is a skill set common, when the competence level common, when the corporate expectation in terms of winning the you know, corporate games are common, the same, then uh, what would be the choice factor by the company between these two persons? I'm saying obviously, and I believe uh, most people would agree, maybe, uh, you know, some minority may not, you know, I appreciate uh, the personal view of people, but then again, uh, you know, I believe, uh, I guess, and I expect that most people should, uh, you know, support me in terms of supporting B. See, B is not a, you know, uh, um, easy playground. B's playground is, a, you know, tougher, uh, is harder. Uh, B has to spoil more. B has to spend more. B has to, you know, uh, spend more energy into the system. B has to do many more things to reach the goal. Uh, but then uh, B has a promise. What is that promise? B thinks that, oh yes, whenever I'm after the work, after a kind of thing, whenever I'm after something, whenever I'm after, you know, a target, I have to fulfill the target, but without spoiling the fairness of doing the thing, without bending the fairness of doing the thing. Here comes the question of spirit of doing the work and the spirit is the root word to spirituality. What is that called of spirituality? Spirituality is understanding the process or the, you know, a method or the, you know, occasion of understanding the spirit which is lying within. Now this, uh, now I come back to Immanuel Kant of his phenomenon and noumenon. And the phenomenon and noumenon, Lord Krishna has uh, mentioned to Arjuna that you see, it was mentioned first of all in the Kotopanishad. Uh, wherein uh, there was a young person of 10 years old, 10 years years, and uh, he had a conversation with the God of death. And during the conversation, he wanted to learn the, you know, intrinsic identity of the self. And through the conversation, uh, he was, uh, you know, revealed the fact, which was again repeated by Lord Krishna to Arjuna, that Atmana Rathi Nam Vidhi Shadi Nam Ratham Evatu Buddhi Tu Sarati Vidhi I mentioned this in Sanskrit original. Uh, the meaning of this is you consider that this human body is like a chariot. 
and this chariot is uh, getting driven forward, backward, whatever. This chariot is getting driven by the human intellect. But again, uh, willy-nilly, we tend to forget the fact that there is an intrinsic personality sitting within called Ataman, and that's the supreme self, and which is present within you. And it's always present within every person, every individual, every living entity on earth. And, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, supreme entity in the form of At Atman doesn't reveal itself uh, always or in most of the cases unless, uh, you know, you are after you seek uh, his intervention in your life. So when I seek the intervention, it's like a chariot is there. I'm driving, my, my intellect is driving the chariot. And uh, it says, Manaha Pragraham Yogacha, mind. Mind is the connecting cord. It is a connecting cord between what? The horses are, you know, pulling the chariot. The horses are your, you know, the energy, the, the vital energy, the vital force that you have put into place. And the vital force is driving your chariot of life forward. But then the instruction and the direction, the speed, the control, everything is in the hand of the, you know, the connecting cord, the mind. And its mind is getting it, uh, you know, connected with the intellect. So the intellect is a human intellect. And here, you know, Kantian principle, Immanuel Kant says, this is the intellect that I am actually putting in and, uh, you know, putting in touch with the mind for driving the purpose of my life and the activities of my life, the thoughts of my life is, you know, actually the empirical mind. What is it? The empirical mind is something which is, you know, influenced by things from outside. For example, you know, it's uh, touched, uh, uh, you know, by the emotions of others. For example, somebody says, somebody scolds you, somebody praises you. When somebody scolds you, you are demoralized. When somebody praises you, you are so, you know, elated, you are so empathic. At that point of time, you become so joyful, happy. So you are influenced by others you know, for uh, others observation of your others, you know, for, uh, emotions about you, you are influenced by that. And, and similarly, your, your, the people have got the demand. You know, when we consider the demand in the market, and demand is somewhere connected with the need, somewhere it's not connected with the need. Sometimes demand is driven out of the need of individuals, the need of the collectives, need of the society, need of people and need of art. But then and there are cases, and that's becoming more important these days for corporate world, that, you know, for demand comes out of non-need sector, meaning where you don't have a, actually the need for it. Yes, uh, you know, yet you go for the demand, you, yet you go for the buying of that object or that particular object or something. So an empirical mind would always look for both. You know, it's connected with the world, connected with the, you know, externals you know, through that kind of, you know, uh, 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 identification of need or going beyond that, which we call it the greed. See, so, you know, which is beyond need, meaning uh, which you don't want to actually in real sense of the term, but again, uh, you have you're fallen, uh, you know, for kind of greedy for that. Why? Because your friend is having that, or, you know, uh, the other person known to you is having that, you know, the person, uh, neighbor is having that, you know, and so that gadget you need to have, that, you know, position you need to have. So, you know, you have fallen greedy for that. Why? Because you are allured to that. You are allured to the externalities, you are allured to the external world. So you are externally oriented and therefore, you know, that is going to influence you and uh, that's going to be the driving factor for you. Now, driving factor for you, when something happens for you, which is a condition for becoming angry, you become angry. Anger comes, anger, you know, catches you. Now, how does it happen? Anger, when it captures, I think corporate HR, you know, throughout the world, they have been working on anger, jealousy, backbiting, uh, you know, gluttony, and uh, greed within the organization. You know, these are the psychological impurities, uh, impurities of the mind present among people. Uh, you know, who are working with you in the organization and spoiling the psychophysical energy of people in the system. As an individual, if you are, you know, calculating always on selfish gains, say, for example, if you're calculating always on something which is, which I've mentioned already, jealousy, let's say you have developed a jealousy for somebody else. Uh, let's say you have stored in anger for anger for any reason. 
I'll tell you, there's a wonderful verse, a wonderful advice given by uh, Lord Krishna to Arjuna about anger. He says, Krodhat Bhavuti Sammahan, uh, meaning anger, Krodhat, from Krodh, from anger, you know, uh, it, it leads to delusions. Sammahat Buddhi Nasi, Sammahat Smriti Vibhrava. So Smriti Vibhrava, loss of, you know, memory. When you are deluded, then you, you know, uh, are not in touch with your proper memory. The memory is lost and then you are in touch with the superficial memory, which is, you know, a bit of it. And Muddhi uh, Nashat Pranashati. You know, uh, uh, then when there's a, you know, uh, loss of memory, then your intellect is lost. And then when the intellect is lost, then it brings in disaster for you. You know, so when you have uh, entertained anger, so you have entertained anger, therefore you are actually entertaining your own destruction, your own ruining of, uh, you know, ruining yourself, killing your purpose, killing your, you know, potentials by being angry. But then anger has got an external cause. Why are you becoming angry? Why are you not in a position to absorb the threats from outside, shocks from outside? Because I've not learned how to absorb. You know, how to learn? I'll tell you that, you know, uh, type A and type B, I've already mentioned, both are, you know, competent enough. Uh, if I may call type A as a Ravana and type B as a Rama. Now, type B is a Rama, is a quality. That, see, Ravana was no less a warrior than uh, Rama, almost the same, neck to neck. You know, but then uh, Ravana did not have the qualities which are worthy of a good person, a fair person. He was greedy about things uh, of uh, somebody else's position, or you know, uh, he was greedy about things of the world, greedy about things, beauties of the world, and then he was he had he was a covetous person. But then Rama, he was fighting for the righteousness and for a cause. He was fighting for a cause, having the same. So the difference is that he's a B type. When it comes to the B type, meaning you achieve the target. But you maintain the fairness of achieving the target. And uh, the moment you are maintaining the fairness of achieving the target, target, then you are doing two things. You are achieving the target on one hand, benefiting the organization and uh, helping the organization out to stand up on its own values and ethos. On the other hand, by you know, performing on the you know, uh, course of fairness, you have helped the society to survive for a longer period. Meaning you have contributed to the sustainability of the society by, you know, being fair person and honest person in the society, in the organization, and uh, by being a truthful person in the organization, you have actually helped the organization to become a long-term player, a sustainable player in the, in the market, in the society, in the world. And on the other hand, you have also helped the society to survive and thrive forward with, a, you know, fairness of things for a longer period. <clears throat> in our Vedas, there was a call given by the sages, Sam Gachyodhvang, Sam Bhajodhvang, Sam Bhu Manamsi Yanatam Deva Vage Yathapurvi Sam Janana Upasate. Meaning, it's a call for the collective. Now, what is a collective? Collective, you know, is a, a group of people for a purpose or purposeless. You know, let's say society. The society, there is a societal purpose. An organization, there's the organizational purpose. So here you have a purpose. There could be uh, some place where there is no purpose. Also, there is a group of people. And now the group of people, what are the commonalities? How do you understand <clears throat> that you are not quite different? You are not different from others. You are the same. Because, you know, why are you the same? Because, you know, you carry the same intrinsics than others. The internal, what Emmanuel Kant had mentioned and what you know, uh, a lot of death told to, you know, Nachiketa and Lord Krishna had mentioned to Arjuna, uh, the intrinsic factor, the supreme seated within as a man is the same everywhere. So therefore you can't differentiate. There cannot be any discrimination on caste, creed, religion, or any other factor. No discrimination. Everybody is your, your, your team. Everybody is your friend. Everybody is your, you know, for, is, is a close person. Therefore, what can you think of? You can think of Sarve Bhavantu Sukhi Naha, Sarve Santu Niramayaha. So you are not thinking of yourself. You are thinking of everybody. 
Now, a good mental would do what? Would think in terms of others. Swami Vivekananda had mentioned, not me, but thou first. Meaning you first. When in my design of things, you come first, then I'm a person of the society, I'm a person of the world. And uh, when me, I come first, then I'm a selfish guy. I'm a selfish person. So what do I understand? I understand my gains. So whatever I do within the organization, I will, I'll always try to find out my selfish gain. Willingly here and there, I'll try to do some cliques here. You know, organizational cliques do develop because of that. Informal groupism and trying to subvert, trying to, you know, uh, disturb the organizational process and uh, squeeze money, squeeze things from there, squeeze benefits from there. And, uh, you know, so selfish considerations and selfish gains become very important for a person with the A type. And the person with the B type understands that there is a world within. I need to manage myself. I have a world within. And in that world within, I am the master. I am the king. I am the king. Rabindranath Tagore had mentioned, I am the Shavai Raja Bashkuri Ei Raja Rajate in Bengal. The meaning is, we all are the kings and we live in the kingdom of this king. You are the king of yourself. That is your zone of discretion. Within yourself, there is nobody, nobody from outside who can rule you in that. So you are the ruler. You are the king. And what is that? Your mind. Say, for example, if I'm connected in a program, if I'm in a class as a student, my mind is expected to be in the class with the proceedings of the class and remain in that. And it's not expected to go away. But again, a diffuse mind does what? A diffuse mind is not, you know, restrained there. It's not, uh, you know, confined in that place. Uh, there's a wonderful, you know, uh, uh, similar, there's a wonderful, uh, example given of human mind is said, is again given in one of our Upanishads, it said the mind is like a monkey which is restless. Human mind. I'm talking about mind of every person. I'm including myself in that. Please don't mind that I'm not, you know, telling anybody else than me that whose mind is a monkey mind. Everybody's mind is that. And you see, that means restless. Mind is restless by nature. Human mind. And uh, assume that the human mind is beaten by a scorpion. And a scorpion bites that mind. A scorpion, assume that scorpion to be there and it bites that same, you know, monkey. And mind is like that. Meaning it becomes, you know, violent. And the mind becomes violent. What? You know, when I am aspiring something for my selfish gain. Uh, maybe, you know, I develop, I nurture jealousy and anger in that. And, you know, with that, you know, my mind becomes so violent and, you know, inside. So I spoil myself. When I'm into work, my in total mind is not into the work. I'm a teacher. When I'm teaching, half of my mind is teaching and other half is calculating. Oh, yes. What is going to be my gain? Extra gain? Additional gain? How do I benefit myself going additional? So meaning a part of the mind is engaged in other things than the focus of the work. When I'm into a company, in a company's work, you know, half of my mind or a part of my mind is given to the company, remaining part is taken for other selfish considerations. So what am I doing? I'm actually betraying the cause and purpose of the organization. I'm actually cheating the, you know, by, you know, the organization. I'm actually cheating the society. I'm cheating the world. I'm sorry I have used this word because, you know, this is a word we should correctly and directly, you know, create a meaning out of it. And therefore, you know, when I'm not devoting fully, when I'm not devoting my mind fully to the context of the work and the, you know, theme of the work or the cause of the work, I am actually, you know, doing an unfair thing. This is, a, this is not fair. This is unfair. I'm debating from the truthful purpose of life. I'm debating from the truthful cause of life. I'm debating from the basic sense of truth and, and uh, you know, the sense of sp or the spirit of, you know, the life. The basic spirit of life is what? It should be, you know, all this fairness. Let us have a fairness and goodness, goodness and fairness for everybody. But goodness of fairness of everybody is, you know, possible by those who can understand the inner world first. Now, uh, I'll, I'll take an example. I'll take a, you know, a reference from Westland of T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot is mentioning that you know, uh, when I'm climbing the hill, I count that you and me, we are only two persons. 
But again, every time I find there is a third. A third is there, you know, who is that third? I'm unable to understand. But then later on, that understanding had, you know, for revealed in him, wherein he understood, yes, the third is there. An universal cosmic associate of yourself. A universal cosmic associate of yourself is there. There's a spirit which is with you, within yourself. And the spirit, uh, you know, acts and works only when you are tuned to the spirit. If you deny the presence of the spirit within, then you deny the entry to your own, uh, you know, you restrict yourself from entering your own inner world. So that is the process of entering in within your world. Our sages have given us, you know, a wonderful, beautiful concept. The concept is the, the concept of punch bayou. The concept of punch bayou, punch bayou is five different uh, identities of the air. The air that we inhale and uh, the air that we exhale, the air after we inhale has got our five different purposeful, you know, existence, purposeful travel within the body, within the system. Prana vayu, like, you know, the prana vayu, prana, apana, samana, vana, ura. There's five different aspects of the air. Now, what are those? Because, you know, when I'm inhaling air from outside, I'm expecting a fresh, good air with full of oxygen, but I don't get that. I get a mix of it. And the mix comes within. So there should be some mechanism within which would screen out it and which would get, uh, you know, oxygen out of it for our purposeful utilization. The goodness has to be extracted from that. So the goodness is extracted and absorbed in your process. That is the classification. Since it's not a demonstration session, I'm not getting into the detailed analysis. However, this is available and uh, anybody can track through. So this punch by you, what it's doing is actually taking out the goodness in different forms for different organs of human system. And uh, the, you know, up to, you know, you're taking out the goodness uh, from that composite here, the one that you are getting out, you know, throwing away, throwing out, is actually required by others in the system, others in the cosmic system. In the, you know, uh, for example, plants, hard shafts, trees, they need that. So you see, it's a balance that the cosmic system has got. Unless we take care of the balance, we actually destroy or we actually dismantle the, you know, the balance within the cosmic system. So therefore, the concept of goodness is there everywhere present in this cosmic system. We need to, we as an individual, you and me as an individual, we need to take care of that. I've mentioned about the Sri Vedic concept of Sangachudvang, Sangbadadvang, Sangbo Manamsi Janatam. Meaning, let's all have, you know, the unity of purpose. Let's all collect together, combine together, and have the same kind of destination and goal of fairness and goodness. Sangbadadvang, let's have the same tongue uttered. Let's all combine the same goodness. And let's offer that goodness to everybody. You think about the goodness. I think about the goodness. He and she thinks about the goodness. And therefore, you know, everybody thinks about the goodness of others. So when everybody thinks of goodness of others, then it becomes a, you know, society, institution, organizations, everywhere it's the goodness prevailing. And therefore, the goodness becomes the dominant force. So people would be striving for, people would be, you know, walking for, people would actually develop things for, people would contribute to this goodness of the universal system. And that goodness is something we should always infuse, you know, the spirit of goodness within the individuals. And the spirit of goodness is a spirituality. Spirituality is not a religion. Religion is different from spirituality. Spirituality is fundamental to individuals. Religion is the process of maintaining and adhering to the certain principles which are drawn out of the, you know, spirituality. And uh, so in some cases, more rituals than less of spirituality. Some other cases, more spirituality, less rituals. So it varies. So I'm talking about the spirituality, the, the intrinsic spirit of people. And when the spirit is there, when you understand the spirit, 
then you understand that the metal should be reformed, refreshed. You know, metal should be developed. I made a mention about certain metals, for example, iron, gold, silver, you know, all these, you know, several uh, metals I, I, I mentioned the names of. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Sri Krishna gives an advice to Arjuna saying that there are two broad classifications, two broad types of attributes which human being can possess or, uh, you know, human being, you know, does possess in his or her, you know, personality. One set of attribute is known as a daivi guna, the divinely personalities, the personality of goodness, personality with good attributes. The other set of attributes is known as a Asuri Guna. Asuri is, you know, the demonic, demonic attributes for a personality. So, you know, uh, in A and B, I would, uh, you know, mention A as a demonic and B as a Daibi. Why B as a Daibi? B thinks that, yes, I need to achieve the target without sacrificing the values that I have inherited without sacrificing the values and attributes that I, I know my organization, my company, my institution maintains and offers, and my society wants me to follow that. So without sacrificing that, I'm going to achieve the target. Yes, I know my way, my path is harder, tougher. It will take more time. It will cost me more. But still, I'm determined, I'm just trying to, you know, take that path because, you know, that's not an easy card, but I'm just trying to take that. I'll take an example of Tata, Mr. Sena is here. I'll take the example of, you know, your, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gopala Krishna's, this bonsai manager. Probably you all know, or those who don't know, I'll give a reference of bonsai manager by Gopala Krishna. He's in the Tata board. And uh, I liked his concept, uh, his concept and the uh, concept of great personality by, you know, of, uh, Lee and Duckworth. Mm. Lee and Duckworth has come up with the concept of great personality, which is actually a uh, derivative of what uh, Peter Drucker had, uh, you know, closed his, you know, uh, public bodies, public sayings or public writings on saying that spirituality the, and the, the, the art of, uh, you know, the giving, uh, you know, we know what are our rights, but we are, most of the cases, not aware of what are our duties. You know, and duty orientation is more important, uh, according to the last, you know, saying of Peter Darker, uh, uh, than the rights orientation. As an employee, the rights I know, as a, you know, lady, the rights I know, as a, you know, young person, the rights I know as a young man, as a son, the right I know as a father, the right I know as a you know individual, as a citizen, the citizens' right I know. And people are out there on streets and in groups to exercise the rights. The trade unions are there, different associations are there, different organizations are there, different you know social sites are there. There are a lot of you know activities and initiatives on the rights. Hardly there are some, there are, you know, uh, some on the duties. What are our duties? If our teacher doesn't do his or her duty properly, then can we expect the rights of a student getting fulfilled? My answer to this question, which I have raised to myself, is, you know, uh, I can't. If I have to fulfill my, you know, if I have to satisfy the rights of my students, then I have to go beyond my rights and, you know, do my duties. So then what would be my priority? As a teacher, my priority should be my duty, not my right. My duty should come first. Duty is what? Uh, we mentioned in ELM Kolkata, we mentioned, you know, for our philosophical statement, Chatra Sukhe Sukham Shikshakaha Chatra Nam Tu Hite Hita. The meaning of this a uh, shikshak, a, a teacher, should draw the happiness and, uh, you know, should feel, uh, you know, well after the happiness and well-being is conferred to the student. After a student has assumed and has understood and has realized and has experienced the happiness and well-being, then only the teacher, you know, gets the, you know, happiness and well-being 
uh, you know, uh, in his or her own life. And if that is the attitude, when this is the attitude of a person, then the person is actually after the duties, not the, you know, uh, 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 rights. Yes, the rights are essential, but the duty first, right next. As a young person, what is our duty? We need to identify. We need to identify what are our duties. Our sages have said that there is, you are indebted. Pancharin is there. Devarin, Rishidin, Rishidin. You have got a, you know, Devarin, cosmic sources. You have got a, you know, indebtedness. You are indebted to these cosmic sources, the light, the air, the water. You can't just, you know, destroy this thing. You cannot just destroy the environment. You cannot destroy the ecology. You, if you are doing some, anything harmful, then you try to replenish. You try to give back. So giving back, you know, that should come out. That should be your autonomous response from yourself. When does it come? The moment uh, the person has understood the real spirit within them, this awareness comes automatically. You don't have to campaign. There's an auto response of the person and the person feels I've taken so much from this art system, I need to give back. I'm taking so much from my society, I need to give back. I'm taking so much from my organization, I need to contribute back. I have taken so much from my you know, family. I need to give back. I have taken so much from my known people. I need to give back. So this, you know, giving. Giving as a principle is generated only when the spirit is actually unfold, unfolded within. This is a kind of unfoldment. I, I call it like an, an example, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, occasionally give that in the morning lotus, which is there, you know, it's covered with the green covers and the moment the sun rises in the east the, with the solar rays touching upon the, you know, surface of the green cover, it opens up, it unfolds. The unfoldment does, you know, the persons, every individual human being has got immense, you know, uh, immense potential. Every young person, every person on earth has got immense potential. You know, it's not dependent factor of, uh, you know, it's not connected in any way with your marks, your results, your, you know, achievements so far, your standard in society, your economic standard, your lineage is not connected with anything. It's you. It's an individual. It's an individual which has got the prospect and the potential, which is enormous, infinite. And that's what is the unfoldment when there is a touch of sun rays. This, uh, you know, the, uh, the the lotus starts opening up and gradually you find the petals, you find a beautiful flower. And the beautiful flower, William Shakespeare says, I'm a flower, I want to become a flower. In one of his sonnets, you know, it says that I want to become a flower. You know, what, what do I do? I want to give. What do I give? I have got a fragrance, I have got a beauty. I don't want to absorb my fragrance. I don't want to you know, experience my beauty. My fragrance is for the world. My beauty is for the world. I want to make the world beautiful. That's why I'm offering beauty to the world. I want to you know, make the world a better place to survive, to live and to grow. That's why I'm offering my fragrance to the world. And that's what is a beautiful flower. I want to become and let that beautiful flower be you know, take uh, blossoming ac across in the world, you know, across everywhere. That's what is a, you know, understanding of your self. And the moment we understand ourselves, our intrinsic self, we understand the worth of it. And we would always, you know, we'll always go by that. And we would always support the view that, oh yeah, I need to, you know, discover my inner world. And I need to understand what enormous potential is there. And then I understand that the goodness has to prevail upon and I would always go for that goodness. Okay, thank you so much. You know, I would like to stop here. And uh, for, at the end, I want to, you know, uh, express my sincere thanks to all participants, you know, uh, who have joined this uh, program today and uh, 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 have spent their time I know to hear me for this period uh, of my talking here, and I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to uh, Calcutta Management Association and also the organizers of the ILM Kolkata, particularly my distinguished colleague, uh, Dr. Jayanto Shaha and his team. 
thank you very much namaskar if there is any question at the end i would i would love to be you know uh, uh, on on this side to give some responses to the question if not an answer thank you very much thank you sir thanks a lot uh, before i request mr dat mr sk dat could i request you to kindly switch on your camera mr dat mr judhaji das he has also joined i can see thank you all of you and mr rao is also there so we are we are absolutely we can start off with the next session but before i do that i i thank uh, professor rc uh, professor rb banerji for taking us through this very interesting session before i request uh, mr dat to take over i would just take a few more minutes to introduce mr dat who we really requires no introduction but i just take a few minute few moments to introduce him Mr. S. K. Dutt is a senior business administration, HR, organization development, and change management professional, and a qualified coach and a mentor. A postgraduate alumnus of the Oxford University of Oxford, Said Business School, Mr. Dutt has over three and a half decades of industry experience, out of which he has worked as the head, a group head, HR for over two and a half decades. he has worked in reputed indian corporates and mncs namely the abg group the rasen intubro group bond mco to name a few with experience and expertise in all domains of hr including organization strategy and strategic hr organization development and change management mr dat has extensive experience in leadership development and c suite coaching and mentoring besides large scale operation he has led only one uh, maybe maybe i'll interrupt and thank you i think uh, the pen profile and this got mixed up this is a little longer so sorry for the interruption but you know i need to say with safe time so i think you read from the other one so no problem uh, sorry for interrupting this way my apologies but just for the sake of time i think we'll we'll we'll, we'll do that it's absolutely up to you sir this is your session so <laughs> thank you, you, you thank you you are the boss thank yes sir please take over no, no not at all thanks, thank you thanks thanks to the speakers for coming uh, thanks to you sir it's up to you now mr thank Dutt, you please. thank you just just wanted to make sure that the audience does not get bored with my profile you know so, so okay <laughs> no problem sir so 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 very thank you so very much for the for the invitation uh, uh, cma and uh, eilm kolkata it's indeed a privilege and honor to be here and on this very very interesting topic both in terms of what dr banerji dealt with in terms of you know self management uh, uh, as as corporate excellence and also you know like the role of values ethics and spirituality in management uh, i i think it is a very very relevant topic in 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 today's world i am also extremely privileged and happy to have my uh, uh, industry uh, fraternity friends uh, judha ji mr m v n rao uh, 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 joining me and of course dr banerji is there and uh, pallavi is Uh, expected any time so thank you all for being here uh, 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 you know thanks and th once again thanks for the invitation uh, so self management you know like whether uh, uh, i mean to take the name of even peter draka somebody as eminent and him has also said that you know uh, for any leadership self management is the foundation stone and then we talk when we talk in the context of leadership leadership cannot be there without a context and a purpose so leadership presupposes context and purpose and leadership cannot be operated without uh, values and ethics and if we may add uh, without spirituality uh, and and a little more of that you know a, a while later so uh, while you know we discuss the subject of uh, 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 values ethics and spirituality as much as all of us will agree that this is an extremely relevant topic sometimes it can appear to be a little fuzzy a little uh, abstract uh, you know uh, but uh, uh, in the context of so therefore in today's discussion we will also try to make it uh, keep it as simple as is possible uh, with with examples with examples that we can relate with examples of what we individually believe in 
with examples of what is the what could be the roles uh, as individuals as professionals and also in the organizational context uh, and 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 uh, uh, so so to that extent we will keep it simple and and we'll keep it uh, something that you can relate to uh, it is also very pertinent to note and uh, and i couldn't help but also mention this now yesterday in the context of the judgment and we are not going into the uh, the merits or what is the case but uh, i couldn't but uh, you know sort of uh, think of quoting uh, uh, mr ratan tata in the context of uh, uh, the supreme court judgment and when he wrote on that uh, you know so he said that it is not winning and losing more important than winning and losing and i quote him the judgment upholding all the appeals of tata sons is a validation of the values and ethics that have always been the guiding principles of the group so what struck me was and of course today we were supposed to deal with this particular thing that even you know a group like tata as large a group like tata and they are known for their values and ethics as much as several other indian corporates are so it is an iteration of the subject that we are dealing with and that he chose to mention this even in the you know in the in the context of such a huge win for his group uh, a validation from the from the supreme court and as i said we are not getting into that side of what was the issue i am more uh, you know focusing on the fact that he chose to highlight this before i uh, uh, you know hand over to uh, uh, my esteemed panelists i wanted to also mention because spirituality can be you know it is important that we set the context of spirituality and i was also you know like honestly uh, uh, looking up at some definitions in terms of what could be the best definition that perhaps could you know uh, suit our context of discussion today without limiting the speakers in any way by that definition so one simple definition which i liked was workplace and i am i'm reading it out workplace spirituality is a framework of organizational values and values comes here evinced in the culture that promote employees experience of transcendence through the work process facilitating their sense of being connected to the other in a way that provides feeling of completeness and joy so i like every word of this you know it it covers the spirituality framework covers values it covers culture it promotes employee experience of transcendence through work processes facilitating their sense of being connected to other each other in a way that provides the feeling of completeness and joy so i think that is a good context for us to you know start the discussion uh, i can see pallavi so pallavi welcome uh, good evening uh, and uh, i'll i'll just uh, quickly uh, uh, read out in no particular order uh uh the 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 short profiles of the speakers the panelists we have today even as i invite them to you know uh, uh, uh share their thoughts on the uh, subject so we have we, we of course have dr banerji and uh, uh you know uh, we 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 heard him uh, for the last uh, hour or so uh, uh speaking on the subject of self management uh, and in the context of corporate excellence he is the chairman and director of uh, eilm kolkata and he served as a professor of finance and ethics at the indian institute of management calcutta for close to a decade an international educationist he is currently the member of committee for higher education induction program university grants commission uh, and the board member of national council of science museum government of india he holds a phd in management from calcutta university and has done his post doc research at stockholm university his publications include more than 200 articles papers in prestigious national and international journals he has authored nine books the latest being a sage publication entitled art and science of management in the digital era welcome once again sir uh, i would now read out uh, judajit's profile uh, of course it's indeed a pen profile i mean his accomplishments are of course much larger than what i get to read out here uh, judajit is chro at icici prudential life insurance He started his career in 1995 after graduating from XLRI and has now been with ICICI Prudential for 20 years. He is currently responsible for HR operations and customer service, admin and infrastructure, IT infrastructure and CSR. Welcome, Judajit. Uh, I now have uh, Mr. Rao, Mr. M. V. N. Rao. He is the Group Head Human Resources for LNG Hydrocarbon Engineering Limited. he is leading the global hr function to deliver business value also as a member of the executive management team he drives the leadership and organizational agenda after post graduation in human resource management from xlri uh, mr rao has led the global hr functions in leading organizations spanning engineering projects manufacturing uh, information technology and pharma industries for more than 3 decades 
with extensive experience in leading global and multicultural teams, top level hiring, organization development, change management, etc. MVN teaches us various management institutions, speaks in leadership programs, internal and external, and other forums like NASCOM, CII, NHRD, NIPM, TEDx, etc. MVN has great interest in development of leadership, personal effectiveness, team building, and organizational development. His interests lie in enhancing the capacity of performing managers, senior executives to become better and reach greater heights. He has been designated as the uh, coaching guide for CEOs pursuing coaching accreditation with CFI. He's also the president of CFI's Mumbai Pune chapter. Welcome, MVN. Uh, I now have Pallavi Menon's uh, profile. Uh, she is an accomplished professional and an HR practitioner and learner with over 16 years of industry experience in commercial and product development, IT space, skilled in strategic planning and implementation, people management, influencing and negotiation skills with a passion for learning and development. Currently working in Waters Corporation as Director HR, HRBP for India, Southeast Asia and ANZ. Pallavi has prior experience in working with organizations like Danaher Corporation, Rico, Reliance Communications. She comes with a short stint in sales and marketing as well prior to the career in HR. A certified trainer from IST New Delhi with numerous organizational certificates to name. Pallavi enjoys training and coaching for performance and potential. Welcome, Pallavi. Uh, may I now request uh, MVN to start? And as I said, I'd go random in no particular order. Uh, MVN to maybe set the context and also you know uh, share your thoughts in terms of what today's topic means to you and what are some of the things that you are practicing as an individual uh, for your employees and also as an organization. An overview. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Skiddy. Thanks, Banerjee Saab. I think it was very, very interesting listening to you as we started off and we came in a little early and I think I gained a lot listening to you. And I think your knowledge about the Sanskrit and various other things, I think, uh, really put us <laughs> I think I'm going first, so with your permission. <laughs> Actually, SKD is very interesting. The other day, I was uh, on the dining table, I was telling uh, my wife and my daughters that uh, there is a topic I'm going to speak on called values, ethics, and uh, something, I mean, in spirituality in the workplace, in the corporate, in the world, in the management. And uh, my elder daughter is around 24 years old, and uh, who, first of all, anyway, never liked the kind of company I work for. She says that you work for hydrocarbon and you are the guys who are actually causing all the pollution in the world. <laughs> and uh, you bring out all the fossil fuels and burn them and make sure the pollution and the climate change is occurring because of you guys. And then uh, really, I don't know what kind of a purpose and values you guys talk about. <laughs> okay, <laughs> It was a very interesting start for the conversation as we had. And then it set me thinking, actually. Many years back, if I was having dinner with my father, did I ever talk about any values or anything like that? Or any conversation did ever take place? Or purpose did it take place? Then I, I read a book somewhere in between. I said, a very old book. All of us know Maslow says, the hierarchy of the needs moves up. And when the basic needs are taken care of, people go to self-actualization. So I was just wondering, I think maybe for a moment, I thought maybe my daughters have reached their fourth level or fifth level already very quickly because their basic needs are taken care of and somebody is providing for that kind of story. Having heard that, I think uh, my own take, you know what, I was just thinking, do companies start with values or values get formed along the way? I mean, I, I've seen lots of companies and I, I work for a company which is 80 years old. And when somebody tells me these are the values of the company, or uh, this is how we run the company, which we can call simply as the ethics with which we conduct our business. And the third one, the most important thing is that in my view, spirituality is that it connects all these three things in my view. It is basically alignment of the head and the heart and creating that purpose and meaning and by which people are drawn to such kind of organizations, number one. And hopefully, I think their values and organization values come together. And they conduct their business in such a fashion that it leads to what I call as so-called happy organization, not the happiness which we talk about in modern day organizations where the people have this uh, Friday even get together or something like that, but the more the happiness in which a success is defined in a much larger context. Success is defined is a, a lot of satisfaction where 
the individual values, org values come together and the business is run in a fashion where people feel proud at the end of the day that I work for a company like that which does and meaningful relationship with all its stakeholders. And of course, it also provides me space to actually realize myself and also have a meaningful relationship with the people. I mean, this is what I believe, whether the organization start like that, I always believe that I think if I start a company tomorrow, I start with an idea. I start with an idea, I start with a commercial idea and get on with that in that fashion. And my individual values, I start using as I start developing the organization. This is where when I look back, uh, when we see the founders of our corporation, Mr. Hook Larson and Thorin Tubro, maybe they had those values of actually humility, putting your head down, customer service and so on and so forth. And then they started doing their work and their values became the group values, the small groups of people who came together. And as the organization grew and many of these values became the way we do our conduct the business in respect to that. And there's another take with respect to is that ethics, in my view, is... Uh, the relationships and the way we conduct our business with the various stakeholders, how we deal with investors, how we deal with customers, how we deal with employees, how we deal with so many other people. Of course, these days, uh, may not, there are many governing standards that have come into the place and I'm sure others we will explore as we go forward. And there are a lot of uh, uh, United Nations charters, SDG goals, ESG kind of setup. We have so many of these things to have come in. But what I realize is that if human beings are the most important and human spirits are need to be realized and management's main function is to make that happen. I think these three become very, very vital for the company. Having proper values in place and conduct your business in ethical fashion and also create a space for the people to realize the alignment between the head and the heart. I think that's what I believe. I think uh, that's a journey and it is becoming to the fore more often now because uh, most of the time we not only talk about actually making the bottom lines these days, we also talk about the triple bottom line and many other things. And these concepts are being discussed, talked about, and organizations work towards that. And uh, if you look at it, using these, the three triple bottom line, the many things which are done in the organization, because today we talk about a total well-being of a human in the organization. I don't think I talked about it myself three decades back when I started off in HR. <laughs> so I think you can see as we go along, we are talking not just about physical well-being, but we talk about the mental, social, and the complete well-being of a human being. How do we look into these kind of things? I think there are lots of these things. I'm sure we go forward and explore it. I like to, my colleagues also will have something to share and then we will pick back and talk about things. And this is my initial context in which I talk about. I'm sure our journey is how we fall down, get up, try out and fail and go forward in this journey. That's it. As a professional practicing one, that's my journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, MVN. Very well stated. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Pallavi, uh... Uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, please do uh, give, give the context in terms of your thoughts on the subject. Uh, may I also request you to specifically also speak in the context of the topic that we have a little bit about organizational culture and how that connects with the overall theme as well. Sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to extend my gratitude to CMA and EILM Kolkata, along with Mr. Datta for this great learning opportunity on such a critical topic. More happy to do this because I am an uh, alumni from IMA as well. Um, generally, values have been taken to refer to moral ideas, right? The, they are general conceptions. Uh, some people say they are needs, preferences, dispositions, and so on. But more or less, they describe a notion of rightness, what good looks like, and inherent desirability. And it has a major influence on all of us. Our behavior, our attitudes, creates the broad guidelines in terms of what, what's right and wrong for us. Now we all know that organizational values guide everything you do at work. In many organizations, you have code of you know, ethics, you have principles, you have a company statement, mission and vision. Uh, we have a lot of efforts like uh, having compliance systems and processes in the organization and so on. Very similar to the values, Ethics is also very related, right? They talk about what is wrong, what is right in human behavior and actions. And again, very much aligned to both of these aspects is workplace spirituality. So I think all the three topics are very much related. Workplace spirituality talks about 
um, people finding a sense of wholeness or a oneness in an organization completely, much beyond their uh, compensation or performance. Talking about this topic, uh, you know, can take on days and weeks of discussions and inputs to reach even the first layer of it because it's so vast of its own. However, um, at least given a chance, I will definitely make an attempt to talk about them um, as an overall concept and also try and link to organization behavior, especially their impact on leadership with some of the examples. Now, um, you know, from the organizational culture piece, which Mr. Dutta mentioned now, uh, what I feel is every organization prefers some values over the others. That creates their culture, right? And uh, having a value system and values in management uh, has a lot of benefits. It guides employee behavior. It tells them what is right and wrong, what's acceptable in the organization. It provides a solid foundation for employment policies. Um, it sets your organization apart from the competitors, reduces the uh, risk of inappropriate behavior, and also has a lot of emphasis on employment value proposition. For example, a college or a university might value, um, let's say, independence or pursuit of knowledge, intellectual rigor as its core value, whereas a listed telecommunications organization might prefer customer service, network reliability, or profit making as its core values. On the other hand, some uh, an organization which has focus on um, medical devices or precision act, uh, you know, uh, products could vouch for accuracy, speed, the concept of continuous improvement as the focal areas of values. For this reason, um, there is no such thing as one size fits all kind of code of ethics and culture. As an HR practitioner and also from a leader's perspective, it is important to mention here that having a clarity in your values will also help your organization attract the right people. I do focus on all these aspects while hiring a candidate myself. The easiest example that I see is that when we sit on uh, looking at the technical suitability or the you know, uh, business acumen fitment for the candidates, we also look at the cultural fitment to the organization because it sets up mutual expectations for future actions. And I strongly believe that organizational culture and values they reflect and impact all, I would say, if not most, um, our day-to-day -day decisions. How do your employees interact and work with each other to achieve results? Are they target-driven? Are they customer-focused, ambitious, compliant? Does your organization keep the promise made to its stakeholders? Are you looking at a sustainability index? Is your organization responsible as a corporate in the products and services that they deliver? Or are you an equal opportunity employer in reality, being inclusive, or do you have discriminative policies? Uh, does your organization have regular audits, your financial documents very clear? Or just the basic that, do we encourage employees to behave respectfully with each other? Do you have a speak up avenue or a whistleblowing system when you see something wrong that you can escalate? And of course, do you feel that it's safe to report it? You name any aspect of our daily life at work and you will find the impact and influence of values and ethics in them. So baseline is organizational values either exist in the minds and hearts of employees or absolutely not at all. Thank you, thank you very much, thanks. Very well said. Uh, uh, Judajit, uh, if I may request you to share your thoughts and maybe also bring in the dimension of, you know, specifically uh, the employee connect as also what you are doing for customers in, in, in the light of this as well. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Datta. And um, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here this evening with all of you. And my thanks to Tiger Management Association, Mr. Shinoy and Mr. Bhattacharya and EILM, Professor Banerjee, uh, for organizing this event. And uh, wonderful to have uh, fellow panelists, uh, esteemed fellow panelists with me. And um, so what I thought is um, uh, Mr. Rao and uh, Pallavi have uh, shared their day. I think if we take a step back um, and ask the question, I mean, what is the context in which we are living? And I think it's important because we've just gone through a year of upheaval 
it's been one of those tectonic shifts that have uh, probably nobody ever anticipated and uh, we've seen two three things that have emerged one is uh, the at scale shift to what we call remote work i mean if somebody told me last march that organizations will operate 100% from home i would not have imagined that it would be possible but yes that did happen the fact that uh, uh, customers have adopted to digitization and automation at a rate which is much faster uh, than was probably anticipated it was happening over the last so many years but there has been definitely an acceleration of that and also the reallocation of resources that have happened our capital has been uh, guided into uh, for example making those technological shifts happen and newer kinds of products and services uh, to meet with the challenges of a post pandemic world so uh, while the new normal is yet to be finalized we have to understand and uh, maybe some 5 years 6 years back or even a bit earlier than that there was this coin coinage of this word called vuka a volatile uncertain complex ambiguous and we used to talk about it but frankly speaking the only volatility i mean not that we have not seen volatility we saw the financial crisis of 2009 we saw the dot com bust in 2000 but the pandemic has been obviously the mother of all uh, disruptions and volatility that we have seen in the last uh, at least in my working career and i think for me personally one of the big uh, learnings has been this was the first time in my professional working career that uh, health and safety of well beings became the number one business priority over everything else and i think that was uh, uh, were, uh, were well very heartening and also um, the role that uh, human resources function had to play in uh, making uh, in you know standing by employees in their hour of need is something that most progressive organizations would have done and i think uh, across the spectrum of, at least i can speak for large organizations and large organizations have deep pockets so therefore they are in a better place to deliver some of this uh, definitely uh, organizations went out of their way and beyond to ensure the health and safety and well being of their employees during this time so having put this context i think the question that we have to talk about is what is the purpose i mean why do we have values or ethics or you know workplace spirituality and i think no conversation on values can uh, happen without talking about purpose because uh, companies that execute with purpose uh, uh, it is understood now can create longer term sustainable value so this word sustainability is again not new it's been talked about for the last 20 years but suddenly there is a huge interest and in fact i would say uh, since i head uh, what we call the environment social and governance esg the framework um, and a lot of listed companies are uh, now adopting esg standards uh, i want to make a mention of it there is a huge need from investors globally that organization should uh, start uh, doing disclosures on their uh, esg and getting scored on it and esg is about really environment social and governance i'm not spend time talking about it here but the larger aspect of sustainability and sustainability can only happen when there is a core purpose which anchors which is the why we exist uh, and of course the values which is really about uh, how do we uh, uh, do what we have to do because there is a why and a how and a what that has to be answered and it's it's a very fundamental question because uh, some of this uh, while uh, may sound like mere words uh, if you if all of us as uh, professionals can connect to the deeper purpose or the deeper values and guided by those actions they serve as an anchor to help us navigate through because there are a lot of decisions to be taken so i'll give a couple of examples in our context uh, because i've been with icsi potential life for the last 20 years and uh, been part of the team that has uh, helped define the uh, vision the purpose the values uh and the code of conduct and what we call ethics uh so i'll spend some time just giving a flavor of what we've done and before that i worked with uh, g i worked with g capital which is uh, uh jack wilch was uh, probably one person uh, uh who and g was known as the companies for leaders and for values because he popularized the word values and made it a integral part of doing uh of uh, everything that g did uh and uh, since i came come from that background uh, uh, well, later we can also talk about uh, how g propagated values in the organization but to go back again uh, to summarize i think in our context uh, we are a life insurance company so we see ourselves as trustees of public money it's important to understand our purpose what is a trustee of public money trustee of public money is that we keep money in 
say we have a fiduciary responsibility to keep the money safe of our policy holders and return it back to them when they need it either in terms of when the policy matures or in the terms of a claim which is a very important moment of truth so we have articulated our vision as to be an enduring organization which uh, serves the long term savings and protection needs of our customers with sensitivity each of these words have been chosen with a lot of care sensitivity is because at the end of the day we have to be sensitive to the needs of the customers on a technical point we cannot be repudiating a claim and that is an important aspect because the end of the day or we cannot be selling a product uh, for example we have a value call customer first how would you operationalize it the way we operationalize it is by saying that we should not manufacture a product that we are ashamed of selling to our friends or family or when we are dealing with a customer issue or a customer grievance we have to be fair to the customer at the same time fair to the company so these are certain principles that we set which guide our decision making because there are many occasions that come where it's not easy to take up uh, there is no set uh, precedent uh, for example the question uh, with the pandemic uh, top line volumes were down in the first quarter so what is the right thing to do and uh, i think uh, some of the earlier speakers talked about it what is the right thing to do in such a situation you can save cost by you know asking employees cutting their salary you can uh, ask employees to go you can also some organizations have asked uh, uh, you know stop paying their vendors and their partners in turn therefore they have to ask the employees to go is that the right thing to do because we have to understand that if you really want to be an enduring institution then you have to also follow what are called sustainable practices that engender trust and engender trust is not just with the employees alone with customers with the larger community and the stakeholders which is the a uh, triple bottom line that uh, mr rao talked about so i think i just give a flavor in terms of how the vision and the values of an organization can be intertwined very powerfully and if you connect with it at a visceral level at a deeper level it also brings out the best in all of us and there is a very uh, you know uh, it's a very simple saying and uh, so there was this mason who was building laying bricks and the question that was asked to him is what are you doing and the mason said that i'm building a mansion so you have a vision a larger purpose of being part of a bigger bigger whole and not just he could have also said i am only laying a brick so when you connect with the larger purpose you also felt a sense of uh, if i were to use the word motivation to do something bigger because all of us uh, would like our lives to and it gives us meaning and i think that's very powerful linking it back to ethics now the way i look at it is that values are something that we encourage our employees to do we encourage our employees to live by uh, these are not they're different from uh, what we call the code of conduct because the code of conduct clearly defines what is not acceptable and what will be capital punishment so for example a fraud fraud is obviously has to be met with capital punishment that is very clear there is the law of the land any violation of regulation and we are a regulated entity or a statutory violation will automatically meet an immediate penalty so that is one part of it but between the right thing to do and what is the wrong thing to do there is always a bit of a gray zone and that is where the ethics come and some of this is about drawing your red line in the sand as an individual and the organization has to also decide what is the red line it will draw for example will it be totally transparent about the charges of a product and explain to customers or rather will it hide the charges in fine print so that the customer is not aware so and there are many examples of such in financial services and i'm sure for all other products and services so ethics is something that which tells you about what you will not do values is about what you will do and the whole aspect of spirituality as i see it is really at a more i mean for more relevant from a senior management perspective because the larger question i think that organizations have to in senior management has to answer is is the organization a vehicle for their ambition or the institution comes first if the institution comes first all of us are technically then we are servants of the institution we have a role to play and we are trustees of the chair that we sit in because we have to also understand as professionals we come and go but the institution has to endure an institution can only endure when organizations do the right thing and i think the whole purpose i mean the whole uh, concept of having purpose values ethics and uh, spirituality dovetails all of this together to anchor us into doing the right thing and that is the way i like to see about it and also to i think more importantly not about doing the right thing it is very important to know what is not the right thing to do or what should one not do and that is even harder because uh, uh, we can also talk about you know being humility is a great value but uh, is it okay to spread disinformation about your colleague 
uh, in through the grapevine? These are questions, and these are questions that only individuals have to answer. So I think some of them is about drawing a line in the sand about each one of us as an individual, and more importantly, at an organization level, uh, the leadership has to draw the line in the sand of what it will tolerate and what it will not tolerate. And of course, then there is the aspect of what we said the the, the legality of it all, which is uh, the law of the land. And of course, nobody has any dispute over that. But between the law of the land and the right thing, there is always a gray zone, and that is where it's very important to establish very strong principles of an ethics to make sure that uh, therefore the organization because it's a slippery slope and the closer you get to the red line you may cross over the cliff and that is the destruction of the organization and that is what um, investors are also looking at and the reason i'm saying investors are looking at because they're sitting with lots of capital and they want to make sure that they're investing in companies that are going to be sustainable so nobody wants to invest in companies which are likely to be doing practices which can lead to uh, volatility or unsustainability in the medium to long term. So that is my uh, thought on this. And uh, linking it back to the question of employee connect, Mr. Datta, as you said, if you are able to sharply articulate, and HR has a great role to play to sharply articulate it, that creates a powerful sense of connect with employees, and that will spur deeper motivation. And there is a lot of research done by Daniel Pink, uh, where he talks about uh, the three drivers of motivation, which I resonate with. And there are, of course, lots of theories of motivation, and but uh, which talks about having a purpose which talks about empowerment and autonomy. Uh, but purpose is fundamental because if you, without purpose, uh, how do we make meaning of what we do? And uh, purpose without values, again, uh, uh, it does not have any meaning. So values and purpose, ethics, and uh, workplace spirituality, in my mind, uh, are all intertwined. And they serve to connect with employees at a visceral level. And that brings in the discretionary effort, that extra effort to make sure that all of us then are making sure we operate as guardrails for the organization and ensure that we follow sustainable practices. So that is, uh, uh, it's been a bit long, but thank you so much for this opportunity. But I uh, hope I've been able to uh, of course, of course. clarify. It's been very useful. Thank you. Thanks, Gideye. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Banerjee, uh, uh, you know, of course, uh, if you'll please share your thoughts on the topic. And also additionally, you know, uh, uh, sort of trying to use your experience, you have seen the transition, you know, from, uh, in, in so far as the society is concerned, in so far as the corporates are concerned, you have seen the transition of awareness, what it was. See, values, ethics, spirituality always operated. But in corporates and elsewhere, you have also seen this awareness growing. So what are your thoughts also when you speak in terms of this growing awareness, as much as there, I suppose, is all, uh, also a long way to go? Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Good evening. And uh... I just uh, mentioned that it's so much uh, enriching uh, being here, meaning all speakers, uh, you know, panelists, uh, um, uh, Mr. Rao, Mr. Dash, and Ms. Menon. You know, it's been, uh, and also you know, the coordination by Mr. Dash, uh, you, uh, is being really enriching and I'm very happy being here. Yes, I come back on your question, you know, maybe in another few minutes time, I'll, Try to give my response to that. Uh, first of all, I'll uh, give response, uh, meaning I thought that I need to tell something about uh, the discussion that Mr. Rao had with his, uh, you know, elder daughter yesterday on the dinner table. You know, and uh, she addressed the question that being in the hydrocarbon, uh, you are actually the pollutant in the society and you are creating problems, uh, you know, for the environment and we are here to cleanse the environment, you know. So, you know, what right you have to talk about the values or kind of thing, kind of that notion. And I'm not saying that he, she's asking this kind of question, but kind of there's a kind of notion. See, in, in this world, whatever we are doing, uh, we are always in a mix of things. So, you know, uh, certain things we are destined to do which are good for the growth, but may not be good for our spiritual well-being. And we are just trying to do that. Um, I'll refer to a European uh, study on the values. European value studies is published by Oxford. Uh, it's available. It's uh, done long back. It's uh, done in the you know, first, uh, 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 immediately after 2000. And uh, it was a pan-European you know, study. Uh, we had some interactions in Germany, in Switzerland, in some part of USA, some interaction with students on this. You know, how do you perceive, like, you know, the moment uh, people talk about values, spirituality, things, you know, it appears that it's something different. I'm in a workplace, 
I'm doing something. I have a you know ambition. I have a career path, and that person is talking about values, and that person is talking about spirituality. So should be you know, uh, 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 you know that uh, you see uh, uh, that's a different. I I don't uh, come under this. I, I don't uh, uh, put myself into that bracket. I'm different. You know, I'm this. So it's alienated. So kind of divergence created uh, between that. European value study shows that there has been a gradual improvement uh, towards understanding of spiritual values for, you know, day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day thought process. And uh, the understanding is towards developing two parameters, two factors. One is, you know, for the factor of trust. The other one is, uh, you know, the factor of integrity. So one is trust and integrity. Uh, so we took part in, and uh, we were also, you know, for, uh, one of those movers in trust and trustworthiness. So we had a, you know, international program on trust factor. And then uh, there, my objective was to tell people that, you know, trust factor is something which organizations can talk about. But, uh, you know, the trust factor has to be there unless uh, there is a trustworthiness or to be trustworthy, kind of drive in mind, present in people, trust as a factor can't be a dominant factor in the organizations. And uh, I guess uh, you know, companies have come up to the level of developing trust factor as a dominant factor, particularly when you, know, you are disconnected. People are operating from home you know, in the digital era, which I have given em emphasis in my latest book also. You know, uh, in the digital era, when you are not physically connected, when you don't get the warmth of or the smell of other person, the physical smell is present and therefore what you're doing here, you have to bank on your mental framework and that should be a guiding principle. Uh, there should be a guiding principle. What is the guiding principle? I talked about the goodness. Now goodness can, if goodness is a guiding principle, how do I you know, open myself to the spirit of goodness? If I develop the spirit of goodness, then I find then I see the good things in others. I understand the good prospects of others. People may have a good and bad combination of attributes. So I take the goodness of others. I take and I encourage the goodness. So I would suggest the corporate HR or the corporate top management to develop and devise some mechanism, term, ways and means, so that you know you understand the goodness could be something different from my work profile something different from the assigned work or assigned attributes uh, uh, required for the work. But again, some goodness is there present in a person, in a guy. So what you have to do is you put an emphasis, put an emphasis on that. And I guess uh, the companies have come up to this understanding throughout the world, particularly the Fortune 500 companies and Indian, you know, top 500 companies and other companies who are in the digital era. You know, the companies have come to the understanding that you know, faith in people is important. Trustworthiness uh, as a kind of attribute to be developed within uh, you know, individuals and it's becoming more important. So on one hand, the understanding of the requirement of spirituality in, you know, you know, we talk about workplace spirituality, I believe, unless the individual is spiritually oriented, there cannot be anything called workplace spirituality. That could be a workplace doctrines. That could be, you know, doctrines of spirituality. But if you have to establish the spirituality, for example, I'll tell, like in our Rig Vedas, that is a, you know, for, uh, a guideline for this. Yatahu bai imani bhutani jayante yeno yatani jivanti yat prana pradishanti tad brahman. Meaning every individual who has, uh, who is there present on earth or where present before or would be coming in future, are actually the embodiment or a, you know, representative of the Supreme Divine called Brahman. And that means all the qualities of goodness are present in every individual. So when I find that the person is a mix of that, I need to find out, I need to understand that yes, the person has got that goodness within. Uh, what I have to do is I have to trigger off the, you know, elements which are good of the person, which are good for the society, which are good for the organization. And then I actually create a spiritual environment within the organization, 
by bringing up for the goodness or elements of goodness factors of goodness within the organization and i see that the world is gradually proceeding forward that i'm very very you know emphatic on the young people being you know goodness oriented i find uh, my students and students everywhere in the world i have seen the students in uh, almost all different campuses in the world in the western part in the eastern part in the you know european context in indian context in many places and you see this young people are always vibrant with more of goodness than the mature people you know and uh, you know, the, with the simplicity in their mind there is a you know attribute uh, suggested by lord krishna to arjuna and he said he mentioned that this is the best attribute to become a spiritually oriented person if you want to understand divinity then that is the that is the best attribute he had mentioned about this you know saying that arjabam arjabam is a you know simplicity you know if the person is simply oriented simple now simplicity what you know i i need to become good i need to become trustworthy to others i can't deviate from the goodness and fairness i should not because you know i am destined to perform good perform better and i am destined to do better for others also before i do something better for me so this is a kind of attitude we should bring in the workless spirituality more intense than anything else you know for, uh, i believe that we can cultivate this uh, i have a concept called you know uh the workplace you know sage you know workplace sage are those people who are actually cultivating the goodness uh, within themselves and across the organization and for the society so you have to a manager has to become a workplace sage a rishi a rishi in the organization a rishi in the organization a seer in the organization a sage in the organization who does not only bank on the you know current realities and sees the future sees the you know element of prophetism has to be there within the you know framework within the personality of the workplace sage and that element of prophetism would actually drive it forward and would actually make it a better place within the organization and in the society so i'm very hopeful and i'm very positive in this and i got a lot of faith in the young people and i i find and i i i believe that this young people can actually revolutionize the society and the world by removing you know of, uh, the evils from the society by you know of, uh, removing this you know corruption and other evils from the society and then our society would be a better place to live in we shall have a better organizations to work for thank you thanks a lot sir thank you uh, some some really great insights thank you thanks i checked with the uh... CMA, uh, because we started a bit late, we may overshoot seven thirty by some time. I hope hope uh, uh, that's okay. Uh, nevertheless, we'll 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 keep that in mind and try to close ASAP. Uh, uh, if I if I may go to MVN, MVN, um, let me pose you a bit of a challenging question, which is uh, you know, and and you can respond to this in a general context, not with regard to any specific organization. so we have the situations of you know the marketplace and competition and then uh, when we are talking in terms of you know values ethics uh, so to say and the marketplace and the demands that we have you know whether it is the cxo level down to the you know downstream organization uh, what are your thoughts uh, in in terms of how do we reconcile how do we really sort of uh, live the values and ethics that we all espouse uh, especially when it comes into conflict with you know marketplace demands yeah it's quite challenging uh, skd uh, yeah. workplace rishi workplace sage i think that's something which is in my mind is still going on yeah marketplace as we see it, finally there are many people offering a similar kind of a service i mean whether it is in life insurance or whether it is in hydrocarbon or whether it is in any other place ultimately we realize that a particular corporations are able to sustain renew and continue to remain relevant and if you go deep into that i think somewhere you always figure out that it is much more than actually what i call it as day to day capabilities which are demonstrated by the people i think people when the human spirit rises beyond the resource level 
and actually goes beyond and whatever uh, Dr. Banerjee was talking about, I think if you really look at it, when you look deep within, there are immense potential and capabilities which come out in the right kind of ecosystems. You always imagine, oh, this guy is not capable of doing, how did he manage it kind of a story. So you realize that the human spirit, when it is unleashed beyond the resource level, and that is where I believe superior execution takes place in organizations, number one. And number two, as I see it is that, yeah, you can cut a corner here and there and make a money here and there for a while. But I don't think, I think the, the stories of large corporations, what we have seen around, uh, what you talked about in, earlier when you started off with an example, and the bigger ones, they have been around for long periods of time. They've seen through lots of ups and downs and lots of business cycles. And then it cannot be easily explained away by the so-called human resources, uh, their own day-to-day -day capabilities or processes or something like that. It is much larger than that. And that is where the immense trust the customer places in a company, I think is largely to do with what uh, Jude was talking about. I think, why do we go back to a particular customer when there is a difficult situation? Or why do we go back to that particular company when this, because the trust factor, which he's talking about, the trust, the spirit, the kind of unleashing of those kind of energies, which are go beyond the day-to-day -day factors, which we consider as the factors of production. I think they come to real life. And that is where actually the, if the organization can create a space for that individual spirituality to come to the fore, and if the managers become that kind of a ecosystem keepers, I think those organizations survive and actually thrive in my view with respect to that. I think that's the way I look at it. And at the core of all these things, as we see it is that whether you call it spirituality is at the highest level and remaining ethical, what you talked about, what not to do and actually values are what we will do things in a fashion on a long-term sustained basis, not to cut corners here and there for a day profit or a day's two profit. But at the same time, I'm here for a purpose and I deliver on that on a consistent basis. I think a lot of organizations are there as examples around us and they're consistently delivering that to all of us, I think. That's my view on it. But it creates a lot of effort as we rightly put it. I think it's the top management has got a huge responsibility, huge responsibility of laying the foundation for all these things so that a large section of the young people or the mature people find it a place where they can become and they be and also deliver both combined together as I see it. Very, very wonderfully expressed. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, MVN. Uh, uh, Pallavi, uh, another sort of, you know, uh, slightly uh, challenging question to you, which is that, you know, I mean, uh, values, uh, there, there is a set of core values typically, and I'm saying this more as a practice rather than, you know, something which is there carved on stone. Uh, sometimes values can be revisited and there is a set of core values which we indiv as individuals we have or as organizations which we have, which are never compromised, you know, and there could yeah. be an, you know, like another set of values which can be revisited and this thing. Uh, so to say, because there could be values and values. Now, you said something in terms of a culture fit while taking in people. And there are, as you would know, that there are two schools of thought. So one says that, okay, always ensure that, you know, when you hire people, there should be a culture fit. And then you have another school of thought, which says that it actually uh, impedes, uh, uh, you know, organizational growth, innovation, diversity, so on and so forth. Absolutely. So, so if, even in the context of ethics, because you see moral principles, if we take this discussion a little deeper, what constitutes morality, the way we see it, you know, uh, sort of may not be seen by someone else, so to say. So how do you sort of harmonize this apparent conflict in a, in a workplace scenario? <laughs> okay, that's quite a bouncer. Let <laughs> me uh, try to do justice to that. Uh, and this is this, this could be a very personal you know observation and feedback also now what we have been observing uh, lately and of course recent times is a uh, that quite a few business leaders find it very alarming and uh, there's a lot of rise in accusations to the organizations of unethical practices and so on right we hear of uh, increasing um, mess in the stock market manipulation there's a disregard of environmental hazards there's bribery and kickbacks and so on. Now, a lot of these things of do's and don'ts and what's right and wrong, these concepts are put in the you know, code of conduct and your ethics and your you know, trainings, et cetera. 
But at the end of the day, there's something which is way beyond this is also the aspect of managing one's own self, your own personal values. I mean, how much of it can be trained and the awareness created and so on. And very rightly, you also mentioned that it's a two-edged sword, right? When you're looking at a select in terms of cultural fitment or a value system, uh, the whole inclusion piece and diversity in opinions. Um, some people even say that, you uh, you know, if what if the hiring manager has a very toxic uh, mentality or he or she is not ethical, you would kind of end up taking the like-minded people if you're looking at fitment accordingly. So that's a, you know, different parameter of discussion. But, uh, you know, uh, from a lot of uh, aspects of reading on this topic and a very nice article that I read very recently was um, it talks about the purposes of the personal values or the organizational culture that we create and they serve very strongly uh, typically three aspects one that they behave as standards of behavior right for example um, if as an employee you see a petty theft uh, done by a supervisor or a co-worker in the office how do you expect to respond to that um, to some extent, this behavior is influenced by societal values, your concepts of right and wrong. But in addition, uh, individuals must determine this for themselves of what is proper and what is not. And as uh, my co-panelist said, there's a lot of gray zone here. It's not very black and white to say that this is the right thing to do and this is absolutely the wrong thing to do and so on. So that's one that uh, you know, the, the service of the personal value system could be setting the standards of behavior. The second is uh, they create guidelines for decision making and also sometimes resolving conflicts within uh, yourself and with others. Now, I strongly believe that managers who value personal integrity, they are less likely to make decisions that could be injurious to others. Okay, This is a personal belief and I have experienced it also. Related to this, values can also influence how someone approaches a conflict. Again, for example, if your boss asks your opinion about a report that she wrote and you don't like the report, do you express your opinion candidly and or be very polite and flatter? So there is this whole, uh, you know, dicey scenario and a dilemma in terms of the employee. So again, uh, your set of personal values and the culture and ethics help you in deciding, uh, just making the decisions. And the third aspect is the service of influencing uh, employee motivation. Um, can't really explain it, but values affect employee motivation by determining what rewards or outcomes are sought. Just a simple example, quite a few organizations have that employees are often offered overtime work, right? An opportunity to make more money at the expense of their free time and time with their families. Now, as an employee, which would you choose? Uh, would you work harder to get a promotion and take up possibly a more stressful job or have a laid back and accept a slower and possibly less rewarding career path? I'm sure I'm pe preaching to the choir, but nevertheless, you know, some of the examples of workplace values and ethics we talk about are, you know, basic stuff, as many of uh, the people said, uh, humility respect for others, the basic fact that rules and regulations ought to be common and same for everyone, company policies be communicated clearly to each and every one, inclusion, you know, sustainability, uh, taking care of employees and listening to external and internal customers, having a compliant um, culture of no discrimination, no conflict of interest, no harassment, no manipulation, the list is endless. And to achieve all of this, uh, organizations have uh, audits, compliance trainings, um, overall awareness. There's a support system for people having ethical dilemmas. Uh, you have a speak up avenue and so on. But a very important factor is also having leadership and managers who lead by example. If you have the right kind of leadership, it really brings in the value. Okay, uh, Mr. Rao just mentioned a great point about um, how do you see uh, companies sustain and improve and still go on uh, and what's the role of trust and, you know, uh, the image of the brand in front of others. Uh, it just triggered my usual communication and discussion with my business head when he communicates that uh, we are not, uh, you know, price leaders in the market. Our uh, equipment is pretty expensive, but we are still 
one of the leaders in the market because of the precision, uh, the accuracy, the customer service that we provide, the trust that the customers have in us and so on. So there's a huge difference that the value system and uh, the overall ethics and, you know, and spirituality brings to an organization. Thank you, Pallavi. You handled it very well as much as you <laughs> said it was a bouncer. Thank Hope you. So. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. Uh, uh, Yudhijit, a um, couple of things. One is, you know, I mean, when we talk in terms of values, ethics, uh, and, and we've also discussed this, that at times this can sound a little fuzzy, etc. right? So how do we sort of demystify this in the context of an organization and really, because it just can't be the policy book or, you know, the code of conduct, so to say. So in a very simple way where people can relate, how do we sort of percolate this down in an organization where people live this, you know, practice this and live this as one. And an ancillary question to that is you have, uh, you know, served organizations uh, 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 for long stints and you are in your current organization and hopefully you will, you know, continue for long. Uh, 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 so, uh, you know, for, for many years. Now, has that sort of helped you as a leader uh, to influence outcomes better, even in the context of, let's say, even uh, uh, ethics and values or anything for that matter. So, so one is generally how do you do that, and the other is the ancillary <clears throat> question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Shwetha. I mean, it's an interesting question, uh, but I hope to retire from ICSA, but I don't know. Uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, that's still some time away. Um, so yes, I mean, I think uh, we made the point that ultimately we have to understand as senior leaders, everybody is watching us. And uh, every day we are being watched. And so what are values? Values, and we talk about the, uh, you know, the iceberg model where eight nines are under the sea and one ninth is above the surface, right? So what is observable is behavior. And the basic premise that we make is that uh, values drive behavior. And behavior drives the results. The how is important. If you were to say, and why is how important? Because at the end of the day, people expect consistency. Uh, my, from my HR perspective, I think my learning over the last so many years of my working life is the biggest. If you flip around, or rather, if you don't ask the question, what motivates people, but what demotivates people? Uh, definitely what demotivates people is perceived unfairness or perceived inequity. That something somebody got and somebody did not get because there's no rules, it's discretion, right? So the moment you put in rules, moment you put in norms, moment you put in policies, moment you put in processes, what are you doing is limiting excess. That doesn't mean the organizations have to necessarily follow all norms, policies, because you cannot anticipate every situation where you have to go by the rule book because then you become a bureaucratic organization and organizations also need to adapt, be agile. And there are certain things which have to go beyond uh, the rule book. Because at the end of the day, in the larger interest or the larger interest of values, if you say, if sensitivity to customers is important, I mean, I'll give you a classic case as an example in terms of operationalizing. There was this lady who actually had a term policy with us, a customer. And this lady had lapsed her term policy and bought a new term policy because, you know, prices uh, also fall over a period of time. And uh, she bought that new policy. Now, the problem is six months of buying the policy, she had cancer. Now, there is an exclusion period for a waiting period for a new policy. So technically, we would have been absolutely within our rules to dishonor the claim. And nobody, in a, it would have been an open and shut case and from a uh, legal perspective. But at the end of the day, what is the right thing to do? Right? Do you, uh, if somebody has cancer, uh, do you and the person actually bought a policy and in six months had cancer? Because if the person had continued with the policy, we would have paid the claim. Right? So it is a, these are vexing questions. And therefore the question of if you have customer first as a value, if you say sensitivity is a value, then the answer is obvious, right? It doesn't matter whether it hits uh, the PNL because what is the right thing to do in every situation? And that is where the anchoring of values and everything comes together in deciding the right thing to do, whether it's about a decision about a particular employee or a group of employees or a group of customers. And I think, so the larger point I want to make is, and uh, going back to uh, Professor Banerjee's opening session on self-management, a lot of it is about self-regulation and self-management. Because at the end of the day, who controls the CEO? Who controls the CXO? You have to control yourself. I mean, you at this level, nobody is over, you don't have oversight. Uh, and uh, it is also interesting since, uh, uh, we, uh, I think, uh, 
Professor Banerjee alluded to uh, Mr. Gopala Krishnan. He's written a lot about what power does when people come to leadership roles. Sometimes you lose. Uh, you are sitting at an altitude where you, over a period of time, <laughs> and Pallavi talked about, you, you get a lot of people who echo. You live in your own echo chamber. So what is reality and what is, uh, is very difficult to decipher. So it's very important to feel connected, be grounded. And those are things that organizations, I think it's the job of leadership because at the end of the day, you cannot blame anybody else but yourself. And um, uh, so uh, my, my, these would be my thoughts. And uh, going back to the first question in terms of how do you propagate it? I think you have to do it through stories. You do it through examples, through behaviors. There are various tools. Uh, rewards and recognition, G used a lot of that. Uh, so a part of the thing, and I, I am talking about G because um, uh, the moment uh, we used to say, are you GEized? And GEIs meant that you live the values of GE for an HR profession. And so you have to, so at every orientation program, new hire orientation, we would talk about the values. And you had to exemplify the values. So HR becomes the custodian of values. And everything that you do, whether you hire people, fire people, uh, promote people, uh, reward people, recognize people, it's intertwined in all your HR processes. Because at the end of the day, you cannot have one process saying doing one thing, the other process. The alignment across all processes become very important. And then it becomes self-fulfilling. Right now, I've also seen the excess of it when sometimes values have been used. So my ca only caution about values uh, would be that it should not be used to punish, uh, because uh, ultimately values in my mind you are punished for crossing the red line, but for values should be encouraging. That is my personal belief, and uh, having seen many organizations and seen my organization, values are something you have to encourage in people to do do the right thing. Uh, you obviously punish for doing the wrong thing. But you cannot be penalizing people for not doing the right thing enough. It's very difficult to quantify. And uh, you have selective evidence and their critical incidents are only few and far between to take big decisions uh, only about people's careers and about people's lives based on one or two examples. So that is my uh, uh, view. Uh, uh, and uh, G did a marvelous example of propagating the values. But again, uh, there is also a bit of, I would caution that uh, it cannot also become cultural. Uh, there is a, there is, up to a point, uh, people should believe in it. They should resonate with it. But if it becomes a cult, it has its own set of, uh, uh, you know, everything has a everything uh, everything has a consequence. So I think we have to be very careful about what is the consequence we are expecting. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Jit. Thank you, uh, Dr. Banerjee. A quick question, which is. Uh, uh, if you could just uh, highlight, you know, what is the role that an educational institution can play in uh, sort of creating and uh, spreading the awareness of values, ethics and spirituality more and more uh, in, in, in the society at large, as also, you know, like in the corporates, uh, etc. Well, actually, <clears throat> you find that, you know, for values and ethics was never a part of the curriculum, let's say, you know, 30 years ago. Uh, in between, uh, you know, the last 30 years and 25 years, you know, it was started. It all began in the eastern region of the country and, uh, you know, gradually it has been adopted by you know, the national institutions, universities, institutions, colleges, even schools at every level. And, uh, you know, this uh, values and ethics is something which cannot be really taught. You know, is something which should come from within. What you can do, we can sensitize that as a teacher or in a teaching or in a learning context. You know, this is what the companies are also doing in their learning centers or the training centers and development centers. And the institutions uh, which are offering academics and, uh, you know, learning to the, you know, young people, young stars, uh, what they have done is uh, now UGC and uh, even it's, it's global. Now, uh, let's not mention about only Indian regulatories. It's now globally present. Everywhere now ethics and values has become a part of the curriculum, be it a uh, you know, technology curriculum, a science curriculum, or a humanities, or a business professional of any kind. Everywhere now an element of that is there. So you see, yeah, when I hear this as a young person, you know, some impact of that would come in my mind. And uh, at some point of time in my walk, in my you know, uh, career, uh, this would actually you know, have an impact in my personality, if not always, if not all. 
So that's why, you know, I think that, you know, as a curricular content, ethics and values is important, which is now present everywhere. And also we need to do something which is a practice. For example, you know, demonstrative practice is needed. We do in our classroom also, you know, the practice, you know, uh, and but then that is not a compulsory practice. You know, those who are willing, they can take part in the practice. Those who are not, they can't, they should not. They are not, you know, there is no compulsion. But then uh, curriculum is a compulsion because you have to write the exam, you have to, you know, uh, you, have, you have to see the consequences of the things, you have to understand the nuances, you have to see different principles, the Indian principle, Western principles, the difference, Indian and Chinese principle, the Oriental principle, you know, and, and so there are so many, you know, uh, you, you see the <coughs> more different models. So from that perspective, I think it is important uh, to be a component in the learning scenario. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I think we've had a very good discussion and we could, of course, have uh, gone on. But for the fact that, you know, we have the constraint of time as well. So so we'll keep it at this. Uh, I think all of us uh, uh, spoke from our heart and from our experience uh, and, of course, uh, also highlighted what's going on well. And what are some what could be some of the areas where, you know, there is more work which is required. Uh, so thank you once again, and uh, 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 Mr. Bhattacharya, uh, uh, the floor, the virtual floor is yours now. Thanks to you all too. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dutt. Uh, it seems today is my bad day. It's, uh, now my, my camera is uh, declining to start. It's a really bad day for me. I, uh, I Before I hand over to Mr. Vibhut Tannan, who has already joined us, Mr. may I request Mr. Tannan to please switch on your camera and I hope that it's working all right. <laughs> uh, so it's a very bad day for me. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I apologize to Dr. Banerjee for this these kind of technical glitches that has happened to Dr. Mr. Dutt for missing out on the pen profile and leaving your profile red in half. Uh, but thanks to all of you, it was a very, very involving session. It was very interesting to go through the session. Uh, may I now request Mr. Tandon? Mr. Tandon, are you there? Hello, Mr. Tandon? Anirban, I'm there. Yeah. So, so can you please uh, switch on your camera so that I can at least... My camera is on. I think everybody would be able to see me. My camera is on. Okay, so uh, we have amongst us Mr. Vibhut Tandon, who is a uh, associate, uh, assistant treasurer of Calcutta Management Association, and also associate. Uh, I think uh, Anirban went offline for some reason, probably connectivity. So good evening, uh, everybody. It is a pleasure to talk to you on this occasion. It is, in fact, a pleasure to part of this uh, great initiative uh, by CMA and EILM, where it was a webinar on self-management, probably one of the most important aspects of personal and professional life. Because we have seen people from across the works of life, and I've taken classes on different subjects such as personal transformation, having seen people from different walks of life, mm -hmm. be it professionals, corporate professionals, entrepreneurs, sports people, musicians, medical professionals, the only and only difference we find between one and the other person, between the capabilities that one has and the other, between how successful one is and the other one, is how they are able to manage themselves. And most of these are personal capabilities. Most of the difference is based on how well they manage themselves. And I believe that it was perhaps one of the most significant subjects to be covered by the uh, by the speakers and the participants today. I am really glad and I take this opportunity to extend my gratitude and thanks to the revered speakers. Uh, we have had the likes of Mr. Rao, who is the head of uh, HR at, uh, at LMT Hydrocarbon, Mr. Jizadi Das, who is from ICSA Prudential, Mrs. Pallavi Menon, who is uh, 
who is director from uh, ANZ Water Corporations, Dr. R.P. Banerjee, of course, from EIL of Calcutta, and the moderator, S.K. Bhatt, uh, who is currently the senior advisor at UNCPAD's uh, program. So it was, in fact, a pleasure to have heard all of you, to have taken valuable inputs for all the people from different walks of life here, be it professionals, be it entrepreneurs, be it students, be it professors, it is going to go a long way. This learning is going to go a long way. And these seeds of thought and ideas which have been implanted in all of us will be actually carrying us through our careers and ensure that our boat now filled with these capabilities will ensure that we are able to cross this, this river of our lives, which, are, which might be our corporate life, which might be our academic life or for different professionals as well. So a very big thanks uh, and I extend my gratitude to all of you who have taken out the time uh, and enlightened all of us on this very, very important subject, which is the core of success for everybody in every profession. So thank you very much, uh, gentlemen and ladies. Thank you so much, uh, CMA Secretary, to have organized this program. And a very big thanks to all our participants who have uh, you know, uh, taken out time from their busy schedule to attend this particular program and make it a huge success. We look forward to more deliberations on the subject and continued guidance and continued enlightenment on the subject from not only us, from our speakers, not only on such panels, but even offline. Thank you so much. Wishing you all the best. Have a great evening. Take care and stay safe. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tandon. As you could see, once again, I have lost contact with my computer. Now the computer has completely gone on a shutdown mode. So I'm very sorry. But thanks to all of the speakers. Thanks to Dr. Banerjee. Thanks to Team EILM. Uh, especially Dr. Jayanta Shah, Mr. Shuprio, sorry, do, uh, Dr. Shuprio Pal. Uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Mr. Dutt for organizing this all together. And uh, even after the pro final proposal for the vote of thanks, I'm taking this opportunity because I have been bothering all of you, including all the speakers all throughout these days. But I think it was a very interesting session. I have got very good feedbacks on YouTube also and also on my personal WhatsApp number from my members. So thanks to all of you. Just for all the participants, I have already given on the chat box the e-certificate link. So you can click on the link and go and, put, and please take your e-certificate. Certificate, it will come to your email ID to take. So thanks a lot. Dr. Banerjee, thanks a lot. So we'll take leave. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for staying for so long. Thanks to, I extend thanks to all participants and all co-panelists and my regards to co-panelists. And also I extend thanks to, you know, for the elder, sister, elder daughter of Mr. Rao. She was actually the person who set the context rolling. So thanks to her. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.